Okay. All right, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, and we're going to continue our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. Um, where we left off, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to have a word of prayer. But we left off here in verse number, uh, what I put, I put 24. It's actually, we, we, we read those, but that's okay. We'll start there. In first, verse number 24, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 24, <clears throat> Paul writes, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now, we, we saw that he's talking about particularly um, whatever your status is, circumcision, uncircumcision, your religion, in time past, doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you were bond or free, male, female, whatever, whether you were married or single and so forth. And, and he, he says in verse number 25, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress, I say, that is good for a man so to be. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for uh, the wonderful uh, day that you've given us with these saints, a uh, time to come together with those of like precious faith, to be encouraged, to be edified, to grow our faith exceedingly, Seemingly, as your word says, and then, Father, my prayer is that today's study, today's time of fellowship, not just a study, but, but through prayer, through grace giving, through, through the fellowship with, with one another, that we're encouraged, edified, uh, but more importantly, Father, that you and your word, and the word of the Lord Jesus is glorified. Uh, please give us great insight and understanding from your word, so that we, it might bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, that we may do the labor of love. Yea, your love, Father, be put on display. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, look at verse number 25. He says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. We saw, we ended last time, Paul didn't get a direct command from the Lord Jesus Christ about this issue. But as the Apostle Paul, as his spokesman, as God's spokesman to you and me today, he can, notice it says, as he says, Yet I give my judgment. Paul is a righteous judge, just like the Lord. Um, he can give judgments on Christ's behalf as our apostle. He says, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. That has to do with that ministry given to the apostle Paul. He can make righteous judgments on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ using the mind of Christ. And that's what Paul's going to do. He says right here, he says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good, speaking of um, uh, abiding where, where every man abide. Um, excuse me, brethren, let every man, verse 24, where he is called, there and abide with God. He says, I suppose that this is good for the present distress, I say, that it's good for a man so to be. And in particular, like Paul being single at this time. Now, I have, every time I've read this, and I've, I've thought of the present distress as a current intense situation or some type of crisis that was going on. Um, and Ryan, our, our dear brother here, and, and, and as a faithful brother and fellow soldier, he and, and he's a Bible student, he, he, had a, he had a great idea. His, his, his idea was, could it be that Paul was talking about the, the exact, just the dispensation of grace? And so what I did, I studied that out, and I'm going to share some of that with you guys. But that was, a, that was actually a, a pretty good, um, uh, not guess, he, he, it was a good, it was a good uh, study that um, we, we, we put together. It's interesting because I actually, after that, I looked up when Paul talks about distresses. In fact, I looked up when all when the Bible talked about distresses. So it was some very interesting things that I want to share with you guys. But if you look at verse 1, Paul, Paul starts the chapter off by saying, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So um, it wasn't so much that they wanted to know about marriage. Uh, marriage was a God-given institution. Uh, there were Jew, what, I, what I would say Jews by nature at Corinth, like Paul. Uh, Paul was a Jew by nature, as he calls himself in, in Galatians 2, who got saved in the body of Christ. This was a mix of both Jew and Gentile. So they, they knew about marriage and so forth, the God-ordained marriage. And we'll talk more about that as well, about marriage. But something, it, when he talks about this present distress, there was something going on, it looks like. Now, you can take this or leave it. After I studied this out, I looked at, I, what I do is I look at commentaries, just kind of see what the people say. And m many of the commentaries believe that there was a, a persecution by the Roman Empire going on at this time. But, you know, you can take that at least. Um, 
Rome persecuted what they called Christians a lot during that time. And maybe that's something that was going on, but we'll see. But anyway, this issue of distress, of present distress. By the way, that word distress, that's a stressful situation. Uh, we as believers are, are privy to, to, to have stressful situations in life. We, we all know that. Whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's <clears throat> family, whether it's you, you name it, there's stresses everywhere, right? I don't have to tell you guys that. You live long enough, you realize you can get stressed out. And the thing of the present distress, but then there's distress that comes from being faithful in the Lord. What we're going to see is that the Apostle Paul, he suffered all the other stresses I talked about just now, but he also suffered one where he was faithful to the Lord and he had distresses because of that. Now, before we look at that, let's kind of look through and see what the Bible has to say in general, and then Paul specifically about the stress, okay? Let's look with that. You can go with me to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Excuse me. Go to Luke. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the one in Luke. Go to Luke chapter number 21. Yeah, Luke chapter number 21. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking here, and he's going to talk about a time in the future where the nation of Israel is going to go through the tribulation, period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, what's interesting about this is Israel has always been persecuted from the beginning of time, since they, since they became a nation. In fact, when they first became a nation there in Egypt, the first persecution was from Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember that? He tried to destroy them. God delivered them supernaturally through Moses through the Red Sea. Even as they were going in their journeys, the Gentiles around them would go and attack. When they went in the land and so forth, they only had really one time of peace, and that was during Solomon's reign. And Solomon, Solomon means peace, shalom, shalom, peace. And Solomon, his, his reign was a type of the, of the second coming of Christ, where Christ reigns. It says that Israel had peace in the days of Solomon. But King David, his, his father, uh, Saul, they actually, there were times where they had peace, but there were times where they fought against the Philistines. You know the whole thing with David and Goliath. Goliath was that Philistine. He, David went and, and, and killed uh, Goliath. Well, that was during Saul's reign. So the only time Israel wasn't being persecuted for being the people of God was during Solomon's reign and all through. But we're going to learn from Scripture that even though they had distress and persecution from their enemies, there's going to be a more intense time. And that's the time of Jacob's trouble. They always are going to be attacked. I mean, you see it today. What you see with the Muslims over there in the Middle East, ISIS and all these things, Iran and all these people fighting against the nation of Israel, is the stage is being set for the end times of their program. We're at the tail end of our dispensation of grace. But Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the, that the mystery of iniquity doesn't already work. That thing where, 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 where Satan's trying to destroy the nation of Israel, that thing is, all, is always constant in motion, okay? Well, now, as we get to the end of our dispensation, that stuff gets stronger. That focus on the Middle East and ISIS, their beheading, that's how they're going to kill the little flock in the future. If you read the book of Revelation, which is a future book, it says that the martyrs of Jesus will be beheaded. That's why you see ISIS. That stuff is, it is the stage being set for those times. But thank God, before he can, he can work that program, he has to finish our program. That means we go home. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to talk about a time in the future, time of Jacob's trouble. Now, notice what he said. Now, remember, Israel, they're always being, in fact, they were under Roman persecution right there. They were under Rome, the Roman Empire, as he writes. That's during his whole life. Watch what he says in chapter 21, verse 19. Oh, I, I, yeah, the reason I started here... Uh, Look at verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends. By the way, you think that when you learn the grace message rightly by the word, you start to share it with your old church friends, your parents, your friends, and they look at you like crazy. Look, the same spirit happens. There's believers and then there's unbelievers. And whether it's the prophetic program or the mystery program, this is type of stuff, you know. Now with them, being a Jew who believed on Jesus, that can get you killed. Think about this. Just like in Islam, when I bring up Islam, it's because if you want to see in your time what it was like in the days of the Lord Jesus under the Jews of his day, the religious Jews, that's Islam. Islam, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you 
say something against uh, Muhammad or you say something against Islam, your own family will turn you in. Right? That's the type of stuff right here. Verse 16, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Now these are real true members of the little flock. These are Jewish believers on Jesus here. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. Now when he says that, look at the next verse, in your patience possess ye your what? So what does he mean by that? He's saying they're going to have to endure to the end. He says you're going to have to be patient through the persecutions and that's how you possess your soul. See, their souls are going to get saved if they endure. He that endure to the end shall be saved. The same shall be saved. Now, when you rightly divide God's word, I have to get this because I'm, I'm always conscious there's somebody who's probably watching or listening to this who this is their first time. You don't have to, in your patience, possess you your souls today. You and me today. The moment we trust Christ, our soul is saved forever. That's why we're saved by grace. But there is a principle here that affects you and I as believers. In your patience, possess you your souls. How, how Paul would say is, in your patience, possess you your reward. Let no man beguile you your reward. Patient continuance and well-doing. See, we don't have to... We don't have to be patient to endure to the end faithfully in order to get saved like them into the kingdom. We have to patiently endure sound doctrine. What does Paul say? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We have to patiently endure sound doctrine. In that essence, we are possessing our reward. Because if you don't endure to the end faithfully as a, as a believer in the body, you're going to still go to heaven. You're already promised that. You're an heir of God. What you're going to miss out is that joint inheritance with the Lord Jesus where you reign with him. But with them, part and parcel was faith plus works. And that's what he means, possession of your souls. Uh, Luke 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, the armies of these Gentiles, heathens around them, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. There's going to be this, this time. Watch this, verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea, that's the southern territory, flee, into the, flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it, talking about Judea and so forth, depart out. He's saying, get out of there. And let not them that are in the countries enter there into. So if you're out there, don't come in. Why? Verse 22, four further explanation. For these be the days of what? Vengeance. This is God's vengeance on unbelieving Israel. That all things which are written may be what? Fulfilled. The prophetic program, Moses and the prophets prophesied about the coming day of the Lord's wrath, and it's coming. Watch this. Verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child. Now see, he said woe to them with child. Why? Because if you have a child that, that, that there is that you look out for the safety and welfare of that child, but it actually will be a burden in those days to have, have children. Because you got to take care of them, and, and if you, look, we have a five-year-old. Everything that we do, Chris and I, we have to wonder how it affects Jada Lynn. If we want to go work out, we got to, the child care is open from four to seven. Okay, we got. Before we had her, there were days we 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 just go do what we want to do. But now we have a child, we have to think about traveling. We went out to the snow. We drove. We drove I eighty eastbound because our daughter she doesn't remember the snow. She was two years old. When we moved here. We drove I eighty eastbound yesterday for forty five minutes. There was a lot of snow. We let her play in the snow. I sat there like this. Didn't like it. I had enough snow. Then we came back home where there's no snow, right? But but we had to, it, it, everywhere we go, we have to bring her with us. That's just today. But when, when this stuff is going on there, notice in verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck. Talk about the nursing mother in those days. You see, he says, these are particular days he's talking about. For there shall be what? Great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Well, so what I want you to see is that when the Lord talks about distress here, it was a particular great distress, what we know as the time of Jacob's trouble and so forth. And even with Israel, obviously, Israel was the people of God. They're the children of Abraham. God promised to multiply their seed. So the normal course is be fruitful and multiply, especially with the nation of Israel in prophecy. 
Here you got the same Lord telling them in that particular time, you don't want to be fruitful and multiply at this time. You don't want to be having children because it's going to be more of a burden. So I just want to see it was the, the, the issue of distress in that one is he's saying it's a particular persecution or, 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 or distress going on. Let's go see what the Apostle Paul said. Go with me to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. In Romans chapter number 8, Paul talks about distress as well. And what he's going to say is that the normal course of living, what Paul talks earlier, he calls it, uh, look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, uh, the, today is the fashion of this world. He talks about this present evil world, this present time, the dispensation where we live and so forth. And then in this, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That, that is the mindset of the grace believer. You understand that as you go through these present time sufferings, there's glory. Don't even compare. It's not even worthy to be compared. Now down here in verse number 38, Paul talks about, you can read the chapter on your own, but, but you get the context. But what he's talking about here is all the things that, um, the blessings that the body of Christ has and how God views us in this present dispensation. With Israel, if they were going through trouble, it was because they were under the curse of God. Remember I mentioned about the Roman Empire? The reason the Roman Empire was there in the first place when the Lord was born is because Israel was in the courses of judgment that they covenanted with God back in the law. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, if they, if, if they listened to God, He blessed them. If they did disobeyed Him, He cursed them. And one of the curses that the Gentile nations would come and rule over them. Well, that's what Rome was doing. But today, with the body of Christ, it's different. When we go through troubles, it's not because God doesn't love us. I've had saints over the years, new to the grace message, some who even not new, they've been in the grace message four or five years, think that if something bad happened to them, that it was somehow God himself punishing them. No. God doesn't treat his children today like that. He does. Where, where you're going to get direct individual of God to deal with what you've done bad is at the judgment seat of Christ. Usually it's just the sowing and reaping of our own choices. You, in the other stuff, it's just the, the curse of the, of, the, of the world, right? The present world has the curses, random stuff happens. And then you can suffer for his sake. You can suffer as a grace believer. That's the suffering that you truly desire. The rejection, the mocking, and those types of things. Because they lead to glory. Notice here in verse number, verse 35 for context. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. If there's tribulation, does that mean God doesn't love us? No. Or distress. See how he talks about distress? Or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted sheep for the, as, uh, for the slaughter. So as the way Paul uses distress here, he's just talking about the normal distress that comes in life. These are things that come in life. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, all these different things. And here, that issue of distress, it's, it's, it's more in a general sense that that's just what, 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 what happens. And when it happens, if and when it happens, it's not God saying, I don't love you. So don't look at it that way. It's sad when saints think, Something bad has happened. God is somehow punishing me, cursing me, and so forth. Um, that's just not how he operates today. Now, if you were a member of the little flock, Israel, yeah. I mean, when you lied to Peter, like Ananias and Sapphira did in Acts 5, God killed them on the spot. Got them, okay? In Israel, he broke the Sabbath. Went before the judges, like they did in Numbers, when the guy collected the sticks, he was going to make something. God told him, don't make a fire and so forth. To, they said, Moses, what do we do? God said, stone him. we got to make an example. But today, God doesn't do that. There's the law of sword and reaping, but also 
there's the judgment seat of Christ. See, that's when he's going to get payback. Everyone's going to receive for the things which he had done. Okay, that's the difference. You got to rightly divide that. Uh, go with me, if you will, to Romans 11, verse 5. Romans 11, verse 5. No, I don't want that. I don't want that. Don't worry about that. Um, Romans. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians 4. Paul talks about the stresses in 2 Corinthians. By the way, the book of 2 Corinthians, it, it, it has a lot to do with Paul's suffering for Christ's sake. Did I make you do that, bro? All right. Oh, man, look at that. You're right on. You got the notes and everything. No, go back to no. Back to Romans. No, no. This is a student here. He's he up front. I, I say the verse, he writes it down. I say, oh, sorry. He goes, he pulls out, pull out his white out. Remember why I didn't? I just scratch it out. Well, you got neat notes there, man. Thank you. Go back to Romans. No. Second Corinthians. I'll wait on you. All right. There you go. Second Corinthians is actually a book where Paul talks about the suffering of faithful ministry. Um, he starts off the book in chapter 1 by saying, in chapter 1, verse 8, uh, For I would not really be ignorant of our trouble which came to us. And then that's the theme of it. You're going to see how Paul, as the faithful minister that he was, suffered. But also with that suffering, what Christ, the word Christ has to do with sufferings and glory. Sometimes you see the Apostle Paul, he'll mention the Lord. Sometimes he'll say, Christ. When he uses these terms in the context of Lord, it means, everybody know now, the righteous judge. The righteous judge. Okay? So when you read that, and especially when Paul is talking, just think that. But when he uses, sometimes he'll say, in the Lord. Sometimes he'll say, in Christ. The word Christ is, is, is associated with suffering and glory. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall be revealed. It is given on you on behalf of Christ. We're going to see in Philippians 1 in our study on Wednesday. Not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. Paul says that's what we're called to do. Christ. So when he talks about Christ, it's, it's focused on the suffering. Well, that's what first, 2 Corinthians is all about in particular. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Well, start at verse uh, 7. But we have this treasure... That treasure is Christ. The word of Christ is, is his word. In what type of vessels? Earthen vessels. What is that? These weak. God made us from the dust of the ground. Interesting, it was dust. That means there was some type of decay there before he created man. It was probably the decay of what he judged before. He, there was darkness and water. God didn't create it like that. And just from the fact that he didn't just take dirt, he took the dust of the ground. From dust to art. So there was some decay already there. But anyway, the dust, the, the earthen vessels were made of this earth. It's weak. It's clay. Why? Well, let me show you something. Go, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Look at verse 89. Why does God put us in earth and vessels? First, let's go. Did I say 1 Corinthians? Yeah. Uh, you know I meant 2 Corinthians. I had messed up the man's notes. <laughs> yeah, hey, when you do live broadcast, it's a seven second delay. Yes. Give me a seven second delay. I got all these verses up here. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 89. I'd go on the radio back in Minnesota. He had a live show, Brother Lee Michaels. He's uh, we were on radio. He and his wife ended up, uh, they were saved already, but they come to know rightly by the word by hearing the radio. Then he came to our church, and that's a, a, a faithful member of our church back there. He, he had, he had a, a three hour radio show, and uh, it was always on delay. You know, he says it's always a sec seven second delay, just in case, you know, somebody says something they shouldn't and then cut it off, right? And uh, so give me a second. Say, here we go. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. For we would not, and the we is Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus, faithful minister. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our what? Trouble. Which came to us in Asia. You can read about this in the book of Acts. That we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Paul was going through such trouble that his life 
He, he, he feared losing his life. He, he was, he was, he was all, there were, there were people out to kill Paul. They would take vows. These unbelieving Jews would take vows not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. They would lie and wait, and you can read the book of Acts. Uh, a young man found out, he let, the, he let the, 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 the ruler know, and they took Paul and hit him and all this, and all this stuff. Well, he went through a lot for the truth of Christ. But, verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, there was a reason, that we should not trust in who? Ourselves. But who? But in God, which raises the dead. What God has designed, the reason he left us in these weak earthen vessels is so that we don't trust in ourselves, but in God, raises the dead. He wants us to depend on him. And that's what faith is. It's depending on the Lord. So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. When Paul talks about verse 7, but we have this treasure of earth and vessels, same thing here. He says it like this, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of who? It's basically the same thing. He's saying what little power you have is nothing for the excelling power of God. And that power of God is the word of God's grace when we believe it. That's where power, that's where God's power is effectual. The word of his grace, the grace of God, Paul's message, when we believe it. But see, notice we still go through stuff. We are troubled on every side. Now again, in context, this is Paul and faithful ministry. Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Okay? Paul says you can go through some trouble and not be stressed out. That's what he's talking about. No, sorry, 2 uh, second, second Corinthians 4, verse 8. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not what? Distressed. And when you think of stress, just think stressed out. Do you know what's interesting as grace believers? You can have all of this stuff going on in your life, all this trouble, all these problems. I, I think about Don and him from the beginning, just getting out here. What happened when he first got here? Just all the stuff. We all go through stuff. I know, I know a lot of you guys' problems and so forth. Not normal, just my own, but you guys. But if, if you trust that grace of God, you can go through those troubles and not be stressed out. Interesting. You can have all this stuff going on and have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. That's what Paul was saying there. We're troubled on every side, and we have never seen trouble like Paul. None of us. Yet, not distressed. I'm not stressed out. We are perplexed. You know what perplexity means? The Lord talks about perplexity amongst nations. You don't know how to handle the situation. You don't know what to do at times. You look at something and you say, man, how are we going to do how are we going to deal with this thing? But not in despair. You don't, you don't have despair. In other words, you don't, you don't it, it, you, you have some hope. You here's what you do know. With the help of Almighty God and His Word and the mind of Christ, and I got other saints. Other people to, 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 to bear this burden with me, I'm not in despair. Can I tell you, as long as I live, you all don't ha ever have to be in despair. As a grace brother, as your brother in the Lord, to the best of our ability, I'm going Chris and I, we'll be there. Because that's, that's we, and, and we know we have, you guys have our back. I was talking to Brother Matt in Southern Cal, and uh, we were just kind of laughing. We go, as grace believers, there aren't a lot of people who have your back. A lot of people want to stab you. You stab you in the back. <laughs> but it's nice to know, because we were talking about, uh, he, Ryan, and I, we got like a three-fold court deal. And it's just good to know that, man, if nobody else loves me, you know that there's some, there are some people who love me. You know your brothers got your back. They're your friends. They're your brothers. They got your back. We were saying we know for sure that they have our back, you know. The reason I share these things like this is because you're going to get a lot of people who don't appreciate you sharing this stuff with them. Most of the people you try to share the rightly divided word, they're going to say, no, nah, nah, no. You're going to give them material, they're just going to go unread. <laughs> they're going to say, oh, I'm going to come to your church on Sunday, crickets. You ain't going. Like this morning. Yeah. <laughs> but then there's people like this sister. Thank you for faithfulness to teach the rightly divided word of God. You all, There you go. That's why I share that encouragement, because I want you to know, for the 99% of people who don't want it, there's that little percent that does and appreciate our ministry. And that's why I always share with Ryan, because the man comes from Modesto, 
twice a, a week to get it out. To, he could just come and get it and enjoy it. But what y'all don't see is at the end, he takes the video and he edits the video. He edits the radio. I mean, does all these things besides his own problems, his own job and stuff. Paul says, hold such a reputation for the work of what? Hold such a reputation. Let's see Philippians. Because for the work of Christ. And that's what he's doing. And so through that faithfulness, that's why she says, your faithfulness to the teachers of rightly by the word. But it's more than me. It's just all you guys too. It's Ryan. It's you guys. As you give, we have to have a place and so forth. Do you have any that complain? Complain about? About I don't like what you're doing. Oh, sure, sure. If I, I, I don't listen to the stuff. I don't care anymore. It's a long time ago. But yeah, you do. You do. I mean, Ryan's going on the front lines of social media. But there are people who don't like what, what, we, what we see from Scripture and stuff. Yeah. But you know what? But it, since being in California, the apathy of California is different. In Minnesota, I used to get phone calls from the radio, Dorothy, where people didn't, they would tell me, no, I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> Here... I get calls to people. I don't. I haven't gotten a call yet where they said it. I, I just think there's a spiritual apathy that they just don't care. Yeah. Right? Just don't care. That's At least in Minnesota, people care. They got a little passionate about the, the disagreements. Okay, with, with what we see. Interesting. But um, it's just been a different dynamic out here in California. So he says, verse eight: We are perplexed, but not in despair. Now look at this: persecuted, but not what? Forsaken. Those persecutions aren't God's judgment like it was on Israel. Cast down. Sometimes, you know that issue of cast down? That literally means you get depressed sometimes. Right. That's what cast down means. You say, why the long face? <laughs> a horse walked into a bar and the, and, 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 and the bartender says, why the long face? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not a <laughs> here all week. Y'all don't get that? <laughs> long face. Oh, okay. Y'all going to be driving home. Oh, long face horse. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's what that is. Cast down, but not destroyed. You know what? You're going to get back up because I like what Brother Jordan said. He says, you can endure because you will endure. You know that at any moment, the Lord could come and, and, and take you out of here and all your problems gone away. Not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body, talking about our physical body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. When Jesus is talking about particularly his humanity there. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That is how the grace believer is to live. Okay? So I want you to see that Paul talks about there's, 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 there's distresses all through what we go through in this life. Whether it's just the normal natural distress of life in the sinker's world or in this case this distress right here he said yet not distressed here okay so he's he's going to go through trouble but some of your trouble doesn't lead to stress up tr stress there are stressful situations but there are times when you go through things and with that peace of god which passeth all understanding philippians you don't have to be stressed out okay you have the power of god's grace uh, let's look at a couple more. Um, you sh stressful situation, but you're not all stressed out. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 4. Here again is just the general distresses that happened in his uh, ministry. Verse number 3. Giving non no offense, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry did not blame. That's the main thing that Paul was concerned about. He didn't want to bring reproach to the Lord's ministry. And that's that's something that we all should, should be concerned about. We want to honor our Lord. Verse 4. But in all things, and that's what Paul's talking about here, approving ourselves as ministers of God. Now, particularly these Paul and his ministers in the, in the ministry. But notice how he approved himself to men. He says, in much what? Patience. He's, he's enduring these trials. <coughs> In afflictions, in necessity, in distresses, multiple distresses here, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in, walk, in watchings, in fasting. By the way, you can just go and read that. You can see all the stuff Paul went through. When you're having a bad day, going through stuff, just read 2 Corinthians. I would tell you to read the book of Job, but that would really depress you. Yeah. What Job went through, man, I... 
Read Job. What he went through, man. Job is a type of the nation of Israel, of the, the little flock in the future. In James chapter number 5, in James 5, I think we're up verse 18, 19, but James 5, you read it. He tells Israel, he tells the little flock there, he says, listen, remember the patience of Job. Or if you're from the hood, Job. I had a guy, a brother from the hood. He got up and read, said, I'm going to read from the book of Job, man. He was serious. J-O-B. Hebrew Job. You know who Job was? Job was the grandson of Israel, of Jacob. I think, I think his father was Issachar, one of the tribes. Issachar. You can read that in the Old Testament. In, in, uh, but Job is a type of the little flock in the future. God wrote that book of Job way back when, considered the oldest book of the Bible, in order to talk to some people future from us, the little flock. He says, look, y'all going to lose a lot, man, out there. Don't take the mark of the beast. You know, you just got to depend on God. But he, you suffer now. He's going to... He says, remember the patience of Job and how the Lord gave him double or made, gave him more. And that's what the little flock. So I'm saying, Job going through all that stuff, Paul going through what he went through, I don't know anybody in 19 years who's gone as much suffering for the mystery as, as, as in fact, not a lot of it goes on today. It, it, in dispensational circles even, it's almost just like going to church. It's just like, it's just like denominationalism now. Kind of, it's just going through the motions. You know, everyone just goes through the motions. You want that to come from the. You want to. You want to have examine yourself, see if you be in the faith. You want to say, Lord, I know what you're doing. I'm going to do the work of faith. I'm going to be a part of a ministry, getting out the word to others because the time is short. And what we're going to see in chapter seven, Paul's like, the time is so short. If you got a wife, act like you don't have one. He don't say. He's not saying neglect. He's just saying compared to what's important. Like you don't have one. If you got a husband, we'll see that, okay? He tells it the fashion of this world passes away. So we'll get to that in a moment. So I just want you to see this issue of the stresses. Uh, we looked at yeah, we looked at that one. So um, there's all type of different different things. Um, the point is we're gonna go through all type of difficult circumstances, if you're faithful particularly, for Christ's sake. But that's what God says you need to have the hope of glory for that when you go through it. Now with the Corinthians, go back to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Whether it's, it, whether it's the present dispensation or whether there was something going on in particular there, Paul's going to lay out what the mind of Christ is when it comes to particularly marriage. And frankly, he's just going to say, if possible, if you're not, if you don't burn in your lust, okay. Now we're going to, we're going to, when we end this, God, God is for marriage. I'm going to say this: God is for marriage. He created it, and I'm going to show you at the end why He created it. I'm going to write down Ephesians five for him in a moment, okay. But when Paul talks about particularly this present distress, whatever was was happening. He says, I say that it's good for a man so to be. Okay? Like Paul, see? Except for the cause of fornication. We also going to see something for ladies, especially young ladies. Paul calls them virgins. I mean, until you get married, in the Bible, now we know, we live in a Gentile, heathen culture, the course of this world. Everything is sexualized. Just turn the TV on. A billboard. I tell Krista, you don't even have to have a TV in your house. If you go out your house, we go out our house, right on Sunrise Avenue, there's a billboard, half-naked ladies. And our daughter's just looking at it. How can we hide that from? We've got to put 10 on the windows and hide it. Put them. You've got to put a blindfold. You know what Paul says? To get away from that stuff, you've got to leave the world. He's going to say it in this chapter. So you have to teach your children. Because I'm driving along, and Jada Lynn's like, that lady's not modest. Jada Lynn was saying two, two of them. Two of them. Just, we're in a grocery store, mommy. That lady's not modest. She's showing all her. We go, yes, dear, yes, yes. And everybody's not. Mom. <laughs> everybody's not like mom, all right? Modest, okay. These ladies in the world. Like, how do you explain it? Like, what if you do? Because she'll say, that lady, she'll point to her. That lady's not modest. I can see. Yes, dear, yes. 
My mother tells a story when I was, I may be younger than that, we were on a bus in Chicago, Illinois, and there was a gangbanger got on there. We were on the hood, we lived in the hood. And my you know, she told me that boys do not wear earrings. Okay, only girls wear earrings. So this gangbanger, he gets on there, sits next to us, right there, he's wearing an earring. And I go, Mama, he's wearing an earring. I thought you said boys shouldn't wear earrings. She's like, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. She don't let her touch. Well, that's Jada Lynn. I, that's, uh, that's my little girl. She does the same thing. When, when ladies are, are not modest, she said. Well, when it comes to women, in the Bible, a, a, a young lady was a virgin until her father or uncle, in the case of Mordecai and so forth, the father's dead, one of her male relatives gave her away to another man under his authority. It's unlike our world, okay? Now watch verse 27. We'll see all that. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Don't try to get away from the horse or anything. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. Except, obviously, if you burn in your lust. If you burn in your lust and to avoid fornication, Paul would say, go ahead and get married, okay? But he's given us the, the general mind of the Lord here. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, speaking of a woman, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. So it could be that whether it is, is that, whether it's a present distress that was going on, or in a general distress of our dispensation, there's still that care that a, 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 a married person has to have for their spouse. There's a burden and a responsibility, a duty, he calls it, the duty of marriage. Once you get married, whether you, you're a man, you, you marry a woman, a woman married a man, once you get married, you have now the responsibility to take care of your spouse in spirit, soul, and body, okay? Verse number 29. But this I say, now Paul's going to redirect it and, and put things in context. He says, brethren, the time is what? Short. He's talking about the dispensation of grace. Now Paul says it's short then. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter number 13. And look at verse number 10. Start there. Romans 13 verse 10. I'll take a look sip here. I got a little protein powder in there. Like distilled water and protein powder. It doesn't taste too good. <laughs> I gotta get, I'm, I'm 42 now. I got to get my immune system better. I, I used to go in the snow and shovel snow for hours. I used to do it as a little boy, give me a couple of dollars, and buy my mama's mirrors. I go down to the grocery store. I didn't know they were all cheap and stuff. I guess if you pay for a dollar for an earring, but I do it with money. Check this out. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse number 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. The fulfilling of the law. Even during the Lord's earthly ministry, when he says, Good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, keep the commandments. Now, we don't tell people that today. Don't tell anybody to keep the commandments. Tell them, trust the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. But that doesn't mean God's law is not holy, just, and good, Romans 7. We don't fulfill the law by trying to keep the Ten Commandments. We fill it by, fulfill it by loving one another. That's what he's talking about. Not working ill to his neighbor. Verse 11, and that knowing the time. See, we should know the time. What's that, Paul? That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. How can a person be asleep? Well, awake out of sleep is spiritually understood. Paul says to understand what's going on. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, what, what salvation is that? Is that our soul salvation? No, that salvation is the day when the Lord comes and redeems us from this earth. Give us, or give us our, our body. Salvation is in three tenses. Many of you guys know this, but in case somebody, um, in case somebody never seen it, number one, when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved, or salvation, you're saved from the penalty of your sins, the penalty. In other words, your soul won't go into hell or lake of fire, okay? That thing is, is everlasting right there, the moment you trust Christ. As you 
study God's word, and as you get, as every joint supply of getting knit together in love in a ministry, you can be saved, saved from the power of sin. Because as you grow in God's word, it, it frees you from the power of sin and confusion. Sin and confusion. You've got to write your Bible. So that this one happened in the past. This one is an ongoing process of edification. But one day, we will be saved. So this is past. This is present, or should be. By the way, this one, the, the moment you trust Christ, God did that one. By faith, right? You trust in Christ by faith. This one is also by faith. This is your walk. You walk by faith. Now this one, whether you believe it or not, if, you, if you're in the body of Christ, when the Lord determines that to end this dispensation of grace, whether you believe that, by the way, many believers don't even believe in a rapture. They don't. Many of them believe we're going to go through the tribulation period. But whether they believe that we're going through the tribulation period, I tell you what, if they're saved today and the Lord comes tonight, they're going up. Saved. There's the, the resurrection, the rapture, the catching away, the gathering. Saved from the very what? Presence of sin. Amen. Amen. Okay, that's a future thing, the resurrection of the flesh. Okay. This salvation, that's what he's talking about here. Verse number 11, And that knowing the time that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The night is a terminology used for this present evil world. The night is far spent when the Lord's not here. The day, that's the day of Christ is what? Yeah. When, when the Bible uses at hand, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that means it's within reach. If I, if I wanted that song book, I said, that thing is at hand, I could just reach out and grab it. That's how soon it is. Now, if it was that soon with Paul, nearly 2,000 years ago, how much, how much nearer is, the, is our salvation? He saved us from the wrath to come. It's at the door. It's right there. If it was right there with Paul, he didn't know how long it would be. It's God's long suffering has lasted nearly 2,000 years. It's, so if, if Paul says it's clear, if it's near, then it's really near, right? I can see the stage being set for the prophetic program, like I said earlier. But in order for God to operate that prophetic program, he has to end ours. We're at the end, y'all. We're at the end of this thing. Redeem the time. That's why the judgment seat of Christ, the, the forgotten truths, the recl re 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 um, reclaiming of, of, of these doctrines of the Apostle Paul, particularly the one about the judgment seat of Christ and being a joint heir, that's why it's being taught today, and that's why Satan is fighting it, because it, we're at the end of this thing. He knows it's just a short time. He doesn't want saints to redeem the time. Well, we're going to help you guys redeem. We're going to help others redeem. Notice here, verse, verse 12, the night is far spent. The day, that's the day of Christ, is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the what? Works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Now here was the armor of light, but we, what we learn in Ephesians, there's the what? The whole armor of God. We already did those studies in Ephesians 6. Ryan has them, and when he posts them, hopefully you guys are with us. Most of you were. But if you, if you didn't, see those studies about the whole armor of God. We'll put them on YouTube. All right, let's go back. Where were we? Uh, go back to 1 Corinthians, if you will. 1 Corinthians 7. Now, he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, even though it comes after Romans, he actually wrote it before Romans. The doctrine he wrote here, he wrote it earlier than Romans. Even here, before he wrote Romans, he's saying the same thing. Notice here, verse number 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Even if they act like you don't have one, it's be as though. Okay? In other words, he says, understand that there's always this pressing urgency for the things of the Lord. Okay? And they that weep, you know, going through trouble and so forth, sadness, as though they wept not. Keep your focus on what's 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 more excellent, and that is what, what Christ is doing through us, that hope of glory. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. That's the other opposite side. Some days you're up, some days you're down. And they that buy as though they possess not. 
what he's just talking about, just as you go through the course of this world, the daily world, the daily life, don't get caught up in those things. One thing believers can do is, particularly in our culture, is get all involved in these temporal affairs of this life. Paul says, no man that warth entangleth themselves in the affairs of this life. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You should have a real loose hold on this world. The old saying is that the Lord, the Lord come, you have to pull twice to get some believers. That's right. You, you want to kind of tread lightly with the things of this world. Don't allow things of this world to have such a grip on you that it affects who you are in Christ. That is true. That's what he's talking about. You know why? The fashion of this world, verse 31. And they that use this world, use this world. You, this world is for us. You can take advantage of it. You may have skills and abilities to, to make money and, 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 and do things and so forth. As not abusing it. Don't abuse it. Um, God, he's for us using the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yes, the course of this world has usurped some authority and so forth. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, every, all things are ours, whether it's the world. You can use the world, just don't abuse it. In other words, don't, don't put too much stock into it. Why? For the fashion of this world does what? He's saying it's all temporal. For the things that are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Don't get so focused on this, this world. Now, verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. And what he means by that is, there's going to be some, some care you have to take if you're married. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord. How he may please the Lord, the righteous Lord. Total devotion to the Lord. By the way, remember we did the proper gift of God? There are some men and women who have that gift of singleness. Not everybody does. The majority does. But there are some who are perfectly content to be single. They don't burn in their lust for a spouse. Therefore, they can, they can give more time to serving the Lord. See? Verse 32, But I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but he that is married care for the things that are of, that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Your, your spouse comes first. Okay? By the way, even before ministry, how can a man take care of the household of God if he can't take care of his own house? That's what Paul says, First, first Timothy. My number one Priority is Kristen and Jayla Lynn. You guys are a close second. But they're still number one. That's the right thing. A man has to take care of the church of God. He has to first take care of his own. I've had men tell me over the years, I, 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 this is the craziest thing. I had a brother tell me, he said, he goes, my wife is hindering my ministry, man. I said, no, bro, your wife is your ministry. Amen. Yeah. Your wife is your ministry. When we, I was in ministry before I met Krista in Chicago, but when we met, moved, when I moved to Minnesota, where she's from, and they asked us, we were going to move to Arizona. We wanted to get out of the cold. This was 10 years ago. We, we, but they said, Brother Ron, the one guy who was doing a study here and there, he moved to Pennsylvania for his job or something. And they, right when we decided to move to Arizona, the test came, baby. They said, Brother Ron, we need you to stay here and help build this ministry, do this. I said, well, i got to ask Crystal because I just promised her that we're going to Arizona. This is how much we love Arizona. We got married in July of 2004, July 16. We went out and had the honeymoon. That's where we were. We went to uh, Arizona. It was 120 in, in the shade. Okay? We out there playing tennis. We love it, baby. We're loving it. But people walk by. Y'all not from here, are you? No. Because don't nobody in Arizona play tennis in, in the middle of the day in July. So we were going to move there worked out that we good we didn't. So a whole bunch of another reasons. But we stayed for seven years in Minnesota and the rest is history. And then when the opportunity presented itself seven years later we had to it's not Arizona, it's better. We like this dry heat here, but it's not as it, we, we, we're here with you guys and that, this is where we want to be. Every day we, we, we realize California is the place we ought to be. So we lowered up the truck. <laughs> we didn't move to Beverly. <laughs> we moved to Fair Oaks, okay. <laughs> Beverly Hill Village is how I know about California. I, I looked at that as no boy. I always want to go to Southern Cal. Okay. Ryan gets on me because anytime 
I'm not having this on. I wear my SoCal shirt, my little gray SoCal shirt. I love that shirt. I told Matt yesterday, we're we going to make our way back down there, man, okay? But we know this is where our ministry is here. Verse number 32, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cared for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cared for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. See, God looks at it, you're either a virgin or you're a wife. You stay pure for your husband. You didn't? But that's not how our course of this world is. Okay, here we go. The unmarried, verse 34, woman, we got five minutes. The unmarried woman cares for the things of who? The Lord, the righteous judge. That she may be holy both in body and spirit. That means set apart unto the Lord, both in her body. See, when you get married, you have to share your body with your spouse. But when you are unmarried, you can be in body and spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. The husband has to please his wife. The wife has to please her husband. Everybody talk about the Proverbs 31 woman. You can read it on your own. But the thing, it says her husband's heart can safely trust in her. Man, if you got a woman who respects you and loves you and you can trust her, that's what he didn't find it the wife finds a good thing. She's worth more than rubies and gold, man. I'll tell you that. Because a lot of women don't respect their husbands. That's the main thing a man needs. Now, before we end, we're going to go to Ephesians, but don't go there yet. Just, I want to finish this, and then we'll go to Ephesians. And this I speak for your own profit. We want you to, to benefit from it. Not that I may cast a snare upon you. Paul is not saying, I'm not trying to tell you not to marry because God doesn't want you. He's not trying to hinder you or incapacitate your ability to marry, but for that which is comely or honorable, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction, and so forth, okay? Now, we're going we're gonna to hold off on verse 36, but we're going to look at next Sunday, we're going to see this issue of his virgin. Look at verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncommonly toward his virgin, and she be past the flower of her age, and need so required, let him do what he will. He said, if not, let them marry. I want to explain that because the his virgin is, it's, he's talking about the father and his daughter. See, we fathers, I have a daughter. We fathers have to protect our girls until we hand them over in marriage to another man to, to protect them. And we're going to look at that next week. So we'll stop there. But when it comes to marriage, because it's a God-ordained institution, I'm going to show you as we end why the Apostle Paul and God is forming. He says, when people try to forbid you to marry, he says, that's again, he says, don't let them forbid you to marry, and so forth and so forth. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spiritual aspect to marriage. But I want to show you the main reason why God created marriage. Go to Ephesians 5 as we come down to the end. God created marriage. You know, in prophecy, Ryan made a good point the other day about the being fruitful and multiply. That's not how God's mind is today. In prophecy, yes, the be fruitful and multiply. He told Adam and Eve, because he's got to replenish the earth, re refill the earth, right, with people. And then with Abraham, the, the Hebrews, he promised them a people, the Hebrews. You know what it says in Isaiah, the, 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 the increase of his kingdom and peace, there'll be no end. There's going to always multiply. Israel's going to multiply forever. But when you come to the so that's the, but when you come to dispensation of grace, that's not really it. You ever you, you heard of the Duggars? 19 kids in Canada, 20 kids in Canada. They're just and, and they're doing it for religious purposes. They're good when Crystal when show Jay Lynn, because them ladies are very modest. They're all virgins when they get. That's good. But they're doing it for religious purposes from prophecy. They don't write their device. Because when he said, why are you having all these children? Let me be from another one. Well, it's different today. But God, so that's what marriage is for, companionship and so forth. But let me show you even a greater reason. Today in the dispensation of grace as we end, the, the issue of marriage, to get married, is even greater than any purpose that he made known back right there. And it's what marriage represents. Look at, look at Ephesians 5 as we come down to the end. The reason why all this question about gay marriage and this, that, and the other, can two men marry, can two women? The problem is, 
nobody's going to understand unless they see it from God's viewpoint, the one who created marriage. Man didn't create marriage. God did. It come out of the drawing board of heaven. God brought up marriage. Why did God think about marriage? When, when he handed, he made Eve from Adam's rib, he put them together. Why? Because God had something in his mind that he didn't reveal to anybody until Paul. Watch what he says. Look at Ephesians at the end. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Well, you know about the wives. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands and unto the Lord. You know, like husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. So you got, you got the church. Ephesians focus on that. You got Christ as the head. Christ as the head. That's the husband, the church, as the body, that's the wife, okay? That relationship. Uh, Ephesians is what focuses on the church. <coughs> Colossians focuses on Christ, okay? And that's why I call them spousal epistles. They go together. And in the middle is Philippians. It's that bond of love. Love is what brings. Love, love will keep us together. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, Phil. She old school. Captain mm -hmm. Love will keep us together. That's right. Okay? That's why Philippians is written between those five. But here's the point. The reason God created marriage beyond anything, companionship, being fruitful and multiplying prophecy, is because when God did it, he was looking forward to something he's going to do in our By the way, he does that a lot. He does things looking for it in his mind. Us Bible students can look and say, yeah, yeah. And Paul's going to tell us. Look at this. Husbands, uh, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of, of water by the word that he might present it. You don't know if he's talking about Christ. He's talking about Christ, but he's talking about the husband. Too. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. That's important, men. If your wife is, is willing, you can put into her what you want to get out of her. Interesting. Not having spot or wrinkle, any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Women try to put all this paint and makeup on them to cover up every blemish. And God is looking on the inside. He wants that to be what? All that painting and stuff is really a physical picture of what needs to happen on the inside. Watch this. Verse 20, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now watch how Paul, in talking about Christ and the church, he goes all the way back to Adam in Genesis. Look at this. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That bonding, that leaving and cleaving, Genesis 2.24. Now when he says this is a great mystery, we got to end. It's a lot there, but we got to end. Maybe we'll pick it up in Q&A. Sometimes when Paul talks about a great mystery, he'll say, Behold, I show you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15, or this is a great mystery. The overall umbrella is called the mystery of Christ. But there are mysteries to it. He calls them the mysteries of God, actually, in 1 Corinthians. The point is, that's what's going on. When Paul talks about this, there are particular doctrines associated with the mystery. I better do it that way. One of those is the mystery of marriage. You got the mystery of the uh, resurrection, rapture, and all that. Behold, I show you a mystery. Excuse me. Look at this one. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning who? Christ, Christ and the church. Christ, by the way, associated with suffering and glory, and the church is called out. He's saying when God created Adam and Eve and put them together in marriage, God had in mind Christ and the church. He said, this is a great mystery. Paul says, God didn't let nobody know this, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, see that you reverence your husband. Women need that love. Man needs that reverence, that respect. My point is, the, the main reason God created marriage is so that he could put on display Christ and the church. And as everyone got married and, and did it the way God says particularly in, in, in Israel, God is smiling. I'm thinking, he's saying, yeah, 
way, they, they, they're just putting on display. That the God is into types and shadows, man. When you mess up that type and shadow, he, that's why he didn't let Moses go in. You messed up. You, I told you not to strike the rock, but speak to it. He messed up the second coming type. Well, every time what marriage represents, when it's done right, two grace believers, it represents Christ's interest. Now, marriage in and of itself, but he wants it to be done right, okay? All right? So the biggest reason God created marriage is because when he, when he made Adam and Eve together, put them together, he was thinking about what he was going to do in this dispensation of grace. He didn't let anybody know. It was a mystery to reveal to Paul. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? I love you. These saints love you. That's why we have a ministry. That's why I'm here. And that's why we're here. But more importantly, God loves you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, But God commended his love toward us. He demonstrated and proved his love in a tangible way in human history. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to move a muscle, prayer, prayer, go to church, give a tithe. You don't have to do anything but trust him in your heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. When you believe that fact that Christ shed his precious blood on the cross, God will, for your sins, for you individually, that's all you need to trust, and that's all you can trust. God, That's what God says. He saves you that moment. Now the rest of your life, you need to be with us so we can help you do the work of faith, the labor of, have a place to do the labor of love, have some people going to suffer with you. When you do, we all will get that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge. That's my job, to help you get a full reward. We'll help you with that. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and our life in Him. We thank you that we can get into your word with those of like precious faith and study out verse by verse the things of the mind of Christ through the Apostle Paul, yea, and the entire word rightly divided. Thank you for these wonderful mysteries you revealed to the Apostle Paul, how you take you to things in a prophetic program, and only you, Father, the God, the Godhead, you, you guys know what that's a picture and type of. And thank you for sharing that with us today, your children in the body of Christ, as we listen to the Apostle Paul. Thank you for sharing things that you didn't make known to the sons of men. And so, Father, we just appreciate your word. We cherish your word. May our hearts desire your word uh, more than our necessary meat, our necessary food, uh, more than life itself and, and breath. And, Father, we know that at the end, and it's coming soon, we have that glory. We're going to share your glory. We have that hope of glory now. And we know that we can rule and reign with your Son, Lord Jesus, forever. We thank you for that blessed hope. In Christ's name, amen.